Life isn't perfect, and neither are we. Nope. But we know how to face our fears. And have some fun. And talk about all the messiest things of life. Like the messiest things. <laughs> get connected to yourself, get connected to others, and get connected to the life right in front of you. This is The Connected Life with Justin and Abby. That's me. That's you. And you. We have cabinets. I also got a pocket. A pocket full of sunshine. <laughs> a pocket full of sunshine and it's all mine. Uh oh. <laughs> I, I got a pocket. Got a pocket full no, of sunshine. I understand the song reference. I just don't know. How that's your response to my. We have cabinets. Quotes. Yeah, we have cabinets too, and a pocket full of sunshine. And a pocket full of sunshine. Hey, it's a happy day crazy? for me. I had this girl uh, message in, and she's like, "How crazy that you guys are doing a series on faith and deconstructing faith while you're reconstructing your house. Like you're doing construction on your house, and you're actually doing a series on like construction." Yeah, isn't that okay. wild? And then I was like, wouldn't it be cool if we like planned that because we were smart? <laughs> yeah. Do you know that I could be married potentially to Natasha Bedingfield right now? <laughs> you know, I'm just saying that song, <laughs> thinking about Natasha. And her brother showed up at my house one day back when I lived in LA because he was one of my friend's friends and uh -huh. didn't know it. And then he saw a girl who was in, in one of my short films. And then he tried to negotiate getting her phone number for his sister's phone number. But I didn't know his sister at the time, who yeah. his sister like, was. Natasha, but he's like, I, I will care. give you my sister's phone number and set you up on a date with her if you can give me this girl's number at minimum. Oh I was gosh. like, I don't know who your sister is. He's like, I'm just Natasha. I'm like, I don't know who Natasha is. I don't care. <laughs> But I still think I did okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're building the house together. <laughs> oh. But I still oh, Daniel. did okay. Daniel was when I met him, he was in his underwear on my couch. Mm -hmm. mm, that's a good way to meet somebody. Yeah. There, I feel like lots of people could have a story like that with He was you. an interesting cat. Interesting cat. So we have a house. We have reconstructed. We are in the middle of reconstruction. I did pretty well for the most part in my marriage. Landed you. Everything seems to be going pretty solid for Justin. It was solid until this intro. Yeah. Things uh -huh. are about to go downhill Can you real imagine, fast. though, if I had taken that moment and then if I was married to Natasha, you know? Yeah, you'd have a podcast called Pocket Full of Sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would. Uh, she'd uh, sing some, you'd probably was, enjoy her singing on the podcast. I would have her sing A Pocket Full of Sunshine all the time. That's how I'd make her wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> she'd be my alarm. I got up, I got up, I got up. So I'd just slowly increase the volume. <laughs> I can do that for you. I, I, I'll, I'll do that for you. You don't need her. I mean, but I can just take her yeah, song and she, slowly turn the volume up yeah, in the morning. But, oh, okay. Because I was gonna say, but she has a good voice. <laughs> you didn't like Singing that screamo voice. version yeah, of no, it. Mm -mm, mm. Mm -mm. But we got our house uh, going along, and the cabinets are fantastic, and that's pretty fun. Yeah, we're starting to see things that we're gonna put the flooring. Yeah, in dad, and not, dad and I are putting in the heated flooring in the in the in the this master bathroom. To me as a yeah, because you really wanted that because your feet are always cold because your body temperature is weird because your body's <laughs> off all the time. <laughs> so true. And it was surprisingly not that expensive to add in no, the floor. No, very. When you're doing everything from the bottom up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah, so so we got that going on. What are we talking about today? We're talking about loving yourself in the context of religion. Yeah, religion don't like you loving yourself. <laughs> That's like, actually don't true. Don't do it. Don't love yourself. Most religions. You'd be arrogant and prideful. Yeah, most religions create be selfish and self-centered. An ability for my husband to interrupt me every time <laughs> I start talking. Most religions create what? <laughs> Go. Most religions create a distance between us and loving ourselves. Yeah. Or they create an overemphasis on us and loving ourselves. Right. It's well, one or the other. Well, there's not. I think the idea, if there's true loving yourself, and we talked about this before, mm -hmm. if you're truly healthfully connected to love and what love is and loving yourself, it will be manifested in you loving other people well. There'll be an overflow in the way that you see the world and the way that you treat the world. You know, um, there's this <clears throat> verse that says... I also think the pocket full of sunshine <laughs> that I got here, because I got the, I kind of got the giggles. And the, Did you purposely I, interrupt me I again? think it's the caffeine from this tea I that I drank. <laughs> People are like, wow, they're in a good mood. Oh, they drank caffeine. Yeah, that's got me going. Sorry. 
<laughs> so well, I was just gonna say there's this verse in the Bible where this person is coming up to Jesus asking him, like, teacher, what is the most important out of all of the laws? Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right. And I always and the think the hidden commandment of loving yourself is just hidden right there. I I, I didn't even think it was hidden. Felt like a straightforward one to me. Well, people, <laughs> love your neighbor, love yourself. Well, what I was gonna say is, to me, this is the divine balance. Right. Like this is the balance. If you love your neighbor without loving yourself, that is called codependency. Yep. And if you love yourself without loving your neighbor, selfish, self-centered narcissism. Yes. And so there's this divine balance. And I think most people in church don't actually learn this balance. Right. And and oftentimes when we're trying to course correct, I've seen a lot of people spend their whole life loving everyone else. Right. And then they, laying their life down, serving everyone, not having a voice, not having needs, not having opinions, going along with the flow. And then all of a sudden middle fingers in the air because they're burnt out and they're like, I'm done with you. Everything's no about matters. me now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very, it's very painful. So Yish. I think that um, the goal would be that we learn this balance between the two. And I know I was having a conversation with Paul Young. He's the guy who wrote the shack. And we were talking, he was like, the goal is that you get to where you can have other centered um, love. love. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Paul, that's what I did my whole life. I'm codependent. I had other centered mm-hmm. love. And he's like, no, that's not other centered love. You have to be able to be making the choice because you love you. And out of loving you, you are choosing to give away. Not that you are giving away and abandoning yourself to yeah. love others. That's not actually other centered love. That's still about you. Correct. You're still making it. If you're making everything about everyone else, it's because you're too scared to have your own voice or you're too scared to have your own needs or you're not taking care of yourself. And I just see this happen in religion a lot. Yes. Where, I mean, I grew up like everything is about serving other people. Everything is about loving other people. Yeah. And then you're just a miserable SOB on the other side of that because your soul is drowning because no means or needs are being met internally. Mm-hmm. You're not self uh, t- taking care of yourself. So you actually do stuff out of duty or requirement and then you're bitter and you're resentful. Mm-hmm. And then you have all this stuff stored up in your relationships yeah. where, and you start disassociating. Mm-hmm. Like this is how most people get by is they just disassociate to be able to serve and love everybody else. You know what happened with me based on that kind of concept that I was living out of is that when someone would ask me to do something for them, help them, I don't know, whatever, whatever the question was that they wanted, I would internally hate them because I would be like, you're making me do this. Right. Because I had a rule system that said, Mm -hmm. this is how you have to do. If somebody needs something, you serve them in this way without regards to how you feel. Mm -hmm. And so then all of a sudden I was offended because there was a requirement, a forced requirement the minute that the question was asked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it becomes- Which isn't love at all. No. No, you don't love them. You're like, I hate you so much. Here, did it for you. Ha, big smile. I'm from the South. <laughs> we love all of our Southern listeners. You know what I'm talking about. You know so. what I'm talking you about. Know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think it's a, a concept that gets bred into religion is the idea of abandoning yourself. And, yeah. and this is a truth intention, right? Because like the religion that we're talking about today is the one that we know the most about. But this probably applies for lots of religions. Oh, totally. But the one we're talking about is Christianity. And so there's a lot of verses in the Bible about uh, when you lose your life, you gain it. And mm-hmm. to live, you have to be crucified with Christ. And there's all of these things about and dying up. to self. And what does that mean? Yes. And so lots of people take that to mean that you abandon yourself all the time, mm-hmm. that you give up everything about your personality or who you are. And, um, and out of balance, that is that actually makes your life more about you. Right. When I think about something like the verse that talks about dying to yourself, I I feel like my investigations of that was dying to and letting go of my ability to be self-sufficient. My ego. My ego. mm -hmm, My ability to uh, uh, create value for myself. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, my performance. I can perform for Mm -hmm. love and actually dying to my self-ability to make all that happen and Mm -hmm. actually allowing love to just uh, overtake me. Yeah. Absolutely. And letting go of my self-hatred, 
my self judgment, all of those things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I do think like one of the things that I think should be taught in every church is how to listen to sermons, how to listen to teachings. Um, one of the things I think is you have to know yourself enough to know your tendencies. Right. So here's what happens. Maybe they do a sermon on serving, mm-hmm. right? Like the importance of giving up your life and seeing other people. And all of the people who are really good at taking care of everybody else is like, oh my gosh, I need to get better at this. Yep. I need to get so good at yep. this. And they're like, this was the best message ever. I need to keep going. Yeah. And then you have all the people who are not even aware that anything needs to be done for anyone else. And they still aren't aware that anything needs to be They're like, Oh yeah, other people should really do that. Uh-huh. That's a great idea. And so when you know your tendency, it's kind of like if, um, here's a great example. If they're preaching on generosity and your tendency is to be stingy, then you need to think, Oh, this is something that will help me balance. This is a right, healthy bring balance to my, but if they're teaching on generosity and you're an overly generous person. Right. You're already emptying out your bank account, uh, yeah. giving it away and can't pay your own bills, but taking care of everyone else. Then you that's the one not to listen to. This message to. is not for me. Yes. My self-awareness tells me that I am drowning in debt because I've handed all my money away. I mean, that was literally my mom. My mom would give and give and give and give and, yeah. and was in so much debt. Mm-hmm. She was overly generous. Mm-hmm. And I had to go through seasons where I actually felt like I shouldn't give any money away because I was so good at overly giving my money away and, and not saving and not doing any taking care of myself. And so part of it is when you are in religion, there needs to be a place where you actually learn to listen to what is it that I need to balance so that I don't become an extreme version of either of these. Cause I think we abandon ourselves a lot when we're not listening for what what is it that we actually need? So somebody who apologizes all the time, let's say that they do a sermon on um, taking ownership and apologizing. The people who apologize all the time are going to go and they're going to take that and they're going to go apologize 10 times more. <laughs> and they need to have some self-awareness and be like, okay, I actually overly apologize. So I can listen to this message and I can see the validity and the goodness of it and not become overly which, by Unbalanced. the way, you're talking about self-awareness, which is something that we teach deeply on in Living Fully Alive, oh. which we happen to be doing round two on justinabby.com. You can sign up for that in the coming weeks. Yeah, so Living Fully Alive out. really helps you learn how you operate and what's going on inside of you and how to understand yourself and the world around you. That's pretty smooth how I dropped that That there. was so yeah. smooth. So keep going, abandoning yourself. Okay, so I'm just saying um, there needs to be a place where you actually are aware of yourself and can listen to a message and be inspired by it and also see how it applies to you. Yeah. That's something that I'm always doing is really looking at like, what, what do I need? What is that speaking to inside of my life? Where am I lacking? My goal is always balance. And we've talked about Mm -hmm. that in previous podcasts in the past, but how, how is all of this meant to bring a world of balance? People don't like balance. They like extremisms. Yep. So, but yeah, what's the invitation? What will bring me to balance? Yeah. There's some people that I'll say like, you need to really rest and take some time off and take care of yourself. There's other people. I'm like, you need to get up off your ass and do something with your life because you are sitting in your parents' basement, just squelching your life away, not doing anything to participate, get up and do something and work an 80 hour week to learn how to work. <laughs> but this is what I'm saying is that you can, if you listen to a, a sermon on rest, the person who's not doing anything is going to feel really validated by right. it. <laughs> and the person who's working really hard is going to be like, ah, it's for other people. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So the goal is to, to listen to life for what it is that you actually need and what can and add to your world. Right. So I know you wanted to talk a little bit about codependency in regards to abandoning yourself. Yes. So abandoning our, ourselves is basically when we care more about taking care of other people or we care more about what other people think or feel their emotions that they're going through. We don't exist inside of that experience. Mm hmm. Um, It's when we don't know what we feel. We don't know what our voice is. We don't know what our boundaries are. We don't know what we want. A lot of times abandoning yourself looks like running over yourself or not even knowing that you were running over yourself because you're not connected enough with yourself to know that you didn't like it. Give give me an example of what it would look like to run over yourself. Okay. Um, So I was talking to a friend the other day and 
she was um, having a date night with her husband and her husband wanted to was like, hey, do you want to watch another show? And it was like date night. So he was genuinely asking because he wanted to know if that was fun for her. And she was like, sure. And then she could feel herself getting frustrated as time went on Mm -hmm. and um, later could recognize like, oh, actually, I didn't want to watch TV. I wanted to connect emotionally. Right. But I wasn't. I, I wasn't aware of that. I didn't know to say that or I I was just trying to make him happy or there's a million reasons it could be totally. why you would do it. It could be that you didn't even recognize that you had an opinion. Right. It could be that um, you wanted to make the other person happy. It could be that you have a rule that you're not allowed to have an opinion. It could be that you don't want to be high maintenance. But that, oh, yeah. that feeling of I'm just doing something that I don't want to do. I, I recognize this in my own life a couple times. I had this conversation with one of my really good friends and they talked for the whole conversation. Uh huh. And at the end of the conversation, I could feel that I was angry. Right. I was like, I'm so frustrated. But I thought, it's not your job. Like, I mean, it's nice when people ask you questions. Totally. But it's not their job to make me and I was like I abandoned me by listening that whole time because I could have jumped in and said blah 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 and interrupted blah, blah. and been like hey I want to share a few things yeah mm-hmm. yeah and I could tell like oftentimes the way I notice I abandoned myself is the sinking feeling of regret afterwards not <laughs> not that I recognize it in the moment but I remember doing this in church all of the time when somebody would maybe ask you like, Hey, do you want to lead this group? And you end up saying yes, because, Oh, it's such a great opportunity. And that's so wonderful that they want to do that. And I really love, I really love helping. But then afterwards you're like, I don't have time in my schedule to do this. <laughs> Why did I, I didn't say that? check in with myself. And now I already said yes to it. Now I feel committed and there's no backing out in my rule system. <laughs> yeah. Or there's abandoning yourself like when everybody in the group is, let's say everybody's judging. Uh, I remember being in conversations where everyone is judging a, a type of person right. and you're in the group and sometimes abandoning yourself can look like just not not saying like, hey, this doesn't feel good. Right. I don't like I don't like how this is going. I don't like participating in this. Could we change the subject? Right. Anything like that. That's a lot of times one of the ways that I will not, like I remember we were all having dinner a a little bit ago, me and you and some friends and the conversation started getting political and I was like, hey, can we change the subject? Um, Just so that we have something fun that we can chat about. And there was a real, um, but that is a way that I didn't abandon myself. It's, It's having a voice. It's knowing what's going on inside of me and being able to set boundaries. I want to say something to this. So, uh, you know, for the longest time, I had a really difficult, it was very difficult for me to be self-aware or know what I wanted or needed until later on after the thing when I was frustrated. Um, This was our marriage where it would be like three weeks of you being frustrated and me being like, what's going on? And you'd be like, nothing. I'm fine. I'm so frustrated with you right now. (laughs) And then Look how like, quickly I got to that. Three, <laughs> three weeks later, you'd be like, oh my gosh, you know what I've been frustrated about this whole time? I'd be like, what? 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 Well, uh, you know, for me, part of my course correction on abandoning myself and getting out of that was even when people would ask me questions, just say they, they, they would ask me for a favor, advice, uh, to, to borrow something, whatever it happened to be. When someone required something of me for a whole season. I said, let me think about that and get back to you. Yes. I need an answer right now. Well, then I can't give you an answer right now. Yeah. Even if it was like, say this wasn't a scenario, but if it was like, I walked into a car dealership and they're like, well, do you want to buy this car today? You should buy this car today. And I didn't know. I'd be like, I need to, I need to get back to you later. Well, you can't leave the lot without that. You're, you know, we're going to sell it if you don't. Okay, then sell it. Totally. I will not come to a conclusion yep. on something until I've had time to get uh, uh, time enough to become aware internally. Mm-hmm. So I know how to respond to this. Yes. And so me creating delays deliberately, mm-hmm. whether that was one minute later, I responded or I came back five days later and says, Hey, you know that, that, uh, that you need to borrow my truck. I don't want you borrowing my truck. <laughs> Totally. Sorry, it took me five days to decide that, but I just needed it till I knew what I felt about the situation. But what that started bu- building was a muscle, mm-hmm. strengthening a muscle inside of me and built some momentum so that when someone asked me on the spot, 
hey, do you want to do this? I internally real fast, like have this check-in that goes from my brain all the way down to my gut. I don't know how else to explain it. And my insides can calculate really fast. Do I like that? I don't like the sound of that. I don't want to have to do that. Yeah, I can do that, but it's never going to be this week. I'm too overloaded this week. And within the context of seconds, I can go, "Mm, yeah, here's my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I remember you have that. I, I want to add this. Yeah. That felt tormenting to me. What did? Having to be, having to go through that process oh, because yeah. I felt like I was failing people. Mm-hmm. Because I had so lived in this mindset of loving people well and I had to readjust what love was, right? In order for me to do this because most human beings want to be good. Yeah. They want to be loving. Yeah. They want to care. Totally. Like we actually have some really pure intentions. And so for me, my definition of love is I give you what you want so that you feel good about yourself mm-hmm. and your life and that you're helped and whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I had to redefine like first and foremost, love to me was giving an honest answer so that my heart posture towards someone would be gentleness and kindness and patience and not bitterness and resentment. Yeah. And also when I violated myself and said yes to something and got myself into something that I realized I shouldn't have been, instead mm-hmm. of getting angry at them, I started taking ownership. Mm-hmm. So I, I started turning it back towards myself, not in an aggressive mean way, but I started saying, Justin. You're in the circumstance because you didn't pause long enough. Mm-hmm. You didn't You didn't stop to listen. You didn't stop to investigate. I'm not blaming them. Mm-hmm. I'm just taking healthy ownership. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't shaming myself. No. I would just say, hey, this is what I did. This is why I'm here. I need to course correct this. And self-compassion, like it makes sense. You learned how to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, in your childhood, you learned to abandon yourself. Totally. You learned mom's needs and dad's needs matter more. They're going to be unhappy. Church's needs are going to be unhappy. If I don't do what they need, I'm going to be punished. And so a lot of us have learned to not even know what we're feeling or what's going on because we're built to make the people around us happy. Yeah, we're conditioned. We're conditioned. Yeah, we're not built that way. Thank you. First thing, you sometimes you're so good at helping me recommunicate. Yeah, I appreciate that. You're welcome. We're we're conditioned to start making people happy, and that happens a lot in the church because so much is love people, and love is such a foofy term, right? To so many people, and lots of Christians like love is be perfect, be nice all the time, be mm-hmm. kind all the time, and part of love is being honest. And being connected to yourself. If you tell me I can use your truck, but you secretly resent me for it, that's not loving. No. That's people pleasing. Yep. That's fake. And and if you end up having walls up towards me because of that, I'll never know. That's not real love. That's not inviting intimacy and connection. Because what you you talked about, the idea of building walls. So if Abby always want I use my truck as an example because that's been something historically people always try to use for me from me yeah. and I had no boundaries with it in the past. But if you came to me and kept asking for my truck and I kept saying yes, and I'm <clears throat> not actually managing myself internally, mm-hmm. then I create this distance or disconnection yep. going, I have to avoid Abby yep. because she, she's gonna cause I know me. that she always wants to borrow my truck. So I'm just going to keep a lot of distance between her and I so that I don't have to do it, but I'll love her. Well, when she does get past all kinds of borders of, mm-hmm. of like time and space and dodge phone calls. And I'll be like, sure, go ahead. Now that you've hunted me down at my house. Totally. So that's not genuine love. Yeah. And um, I think that there's this place. One of the other ways that church has created codependency is this fakeness, this world where you have to always look good or you have to always be right. God I- bless you, brother. <laughs> God bless you, sister. <laughs> yeah. I was going to go even a step farther of like, I know a ton of people that are like, I have to get my family saved. I have to get my friends saved. I have to, which first of all, if you're trying to get somebody to change, to to choose a different choice, you're trying to control them. Yes. And I believe theologically, God created free will. And trying to manipulate them. Yes. We're trying to manipulate them. I'm going to perform in a certain behavior and way and not be authentic and honest so that you will decide to buy in to the thing that I'm trying to sell you. Ha, got you. I manipulated the shit out of you. Ah, look at you. You got saved. Eat it. (laughs) I know. Like I have a, I have so many friends who like have never been vulnerable with their family about the struggles that they go through, about the hard things 
things. They're not, they're acting. They're trying to act superhuman because they want to represent God well. Uh-huh. And there and there's been a lie for a long time. Like if you follow God, your life should be great. And, and that we're trying to be salesmen for God. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I need my life to look great so that you will want God too. What if the greatest sales pitch for God was an authentic lifestyle? Yeah. Like, hey, we're so effing messy over here and we're loved and we're chosen. And hey, let's just go be humans together and, yeah. and, 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 and choose to partner with each other. Yeah. Move towards freedom. And it's we're just honest here in this space. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It'd be amazing. Yeah, probably a lot more people in droves would come to that type of experience. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. That codependent idea of it, the way that I, my job for God is to be fake for you uh-huh. to see him better. Uh-huh. And, I, and churches preach this all the time. You represent him. You need to, to represent him well. And I mean, I love, here's the thing. There's not even... That's not even bad. Like, yeah, please don't go around like slapping strangers. That's not a good representation. (laughs) You know, like there is, there is, it is good to be reminded like, hey, your actions matter. That is true. I want to be reminded that my actions matter. I would like like to not live a lifestyle of being a hypocrite. Yes. Right. Absolutely. I, I would like to actually have a value system that says if I have, if I, if my value system is a a God of unconditional love, I would like to be moving towards that instead Mm -hmm. of like, yeah, I'm wearing this label on me of, you know, follower of Jesus. And I'm purposely just being an ass and never looking at my life. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's valuable, but the idea is if you're not being real, if you're not being vulnerable, if you're not being connected yourself, because the rules in your head mean that you can't be. Right. Or like even I know that there's rules in our head that we get to and this is and we we teach in depth or more in depth in this in living fully alive about the rules in our head and how we abandon ourselves for them. But if the rules in your head say that you always have to be put together, then you'll abandon yourself to look put together. You'll abandon the moment where you're actually feeling weak and need love and you won't actually have a voice and you won't actually ask for help and you won't let somebody come over. Like one of the, this is a funny thing, but one of my friends that they grew up in a family where their house had to always be clean when people came over. So they would resent people from church stopping by at their house because their house wasn't always clean. Right. And so the, that there was two different ways they were abandoning themselves. One was I'm only lovable if my house is clean. Right. Which means I abandon myself if it's not. Right. And then the other one, which is I don't know how to have a voice with people and tell them my preference. Right. Of so, when to come over. And so now I just avoid people and I get secretly frustrated every time they come. Yeah. But this is what I'm saying. Church culture can perpetuate this nicety culture. Right. That is really mean where you never know where you actually stand with people. And you oh, never yeah. know when somebody's Everybody's you a out. bullshitter. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I see you over there lying, putting on that fake face. Yeah. Uh-huh. And there's a lot of self abandonment. Here's something I've learned. Okay. You have to disassociate if you're not living vulnerably. Yeah. Okay. The way to get out of being disassociated is to be vulnerable. But a lot of church cultures, there isn't a place, especially for mental health with behavior, where you can actually be honest about what you're struggling with and what you're going through. And so it creates this culture of when I'm around church people, I need to be fake. I can't talk about how I went out partying last night and I'm so hungover today. I can't talk about how um, I just had sex with three different guys this week. I can't talk about whatever it is. And and I understand like, I, but listen, there's a lot of churches. I wouldn't want to talk about that stuff either because the people are judgmental and mean. Yeah. Old meanies. Meanies. But what I will say is that if you have to disassociate from who you are, if you can't be honest inside religion, then you're going to abandon yourself. You're already, you are abandoning yourself. Right. If you can't be honest, if you can't be honest inside the context of the people around you, then you're abandoning yourself. And, and what you'll will feel happen, alone, mm-hmm. disconnected, mm-hmm. hopeless, mm-hmm. lost, sad, resentful. And then you'll find that you'd rather hang out with people outside of religion because with them, you can be yourself. 
Well, a thousand percent. And I've had that across the board. Anyone who's ever come through my office, who's like F God and everything to do with all this stuff, you know, they had those backgrounds, those mm-hmm. experiences, and they always come to the same conclusion. My buddies are at the bar feel more nicer. Ex- nicer and more accepting because when I create the biggest messes inside of my life, they're there to be like, it's fine. I'm here with you. Mm-hmm. We all make these, dis- these, these decisions and mm-hmm. stuff. And religion has so much fear. There's so much of this fear control culture. Oh, yeah. The spirit of religion, it doesn't matter what actual, um, I'm not talking about spirituality, but the, the, the heart, heart, the essence of religion, in religion any as religion. a thing, it's, whether Mormonism, it's, Islam, you know, Buddhism, Christianity, all of it. Yeah. The heart of it is control. Yes. I mean, that's not the heart of what the, maybe the main messages are. But the heart of religion that's infiltrated inside of all messages, when religion itself comes into it, mm-hmm. religion says, I'm here to control. Mm-hmm. Here are rules. You mm-hmm. have to abide by these rules. You have to be this expression of whatever. Yeah. And and so we use control always has fear. Yes. Typically, fear the way the you control people is fear of punishment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you won't belong if you do this. You won't be lovable if you mm-hmm. do this. And so there's such a deep control and fear of control that oftentimes we want, so want to belong. And I've seen this with so many Christians. They so want to belong that they they hide so much of who they are to fit in to the church culture. Yeah. And then they hit a moment. And this happens all the time. If you abandon yourself for long enough, you will hit a moment where something snaps inside of you. And then you throw everything in that life away. You burn that whole house to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Light it on fire. And that's what we talked about demolishing instead of deconstruction. Yeah. Where you're like, screw everything about this. Everything about this is horrible and wrong. Mm -hmm. And there isn't that like self ownership of I have been a part. I abandoned myself to religion. It's not that. It's not that they demanded that I do it. It's oh, they may have. Some of them, yes. <laughs> there are absolutely. institutions where they demand that, yes. But also, it's the the thing that we do where it's like, I won't, I, I mean, like, I know this happened to me for years where I was like, okay, I like to smoke cigars. I don't have a problem with drinking. I can't drink alcohol. I wish I could because I'm allergic to it. But I'm the point yeah. is I don't have a problem with it. I cuss. I make sex jokes. Like, I just... I feel comfortable in that world. And then you go into the church world and it's like, oh, they're going to make a lot of judgments on you. Oh, yeah. And I like to be around. I'm around people who are are all kinds of different lifestyles. Yeah. And there's this thing even in church. Like if you hang out with all these people, are you like them? Are you doing things like them? (laughs) Are you letting them know that you're not like them? Jesus like Jesus like literally was hanging out with all the people that all all the Pharisees and Sadducees were like, what are you doing? You're horrible. He's a he's a drunkard. Yeah. He's a wine bibber. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They accused they accused him of because of who he was around. Oh, because of who he hung out with. And it's so funny as a side note, when people are like, if Jesus was here today on earth, I I would I would have never done what they did to him. I'm like, you'd be we the first one at the front of the line being like, stone that guy. He's insane. I will say this. If you read the Bible and you think you wouldn't have done to Jesus <laughs> what was done to him, yeah. then you have no self-awareness. Yeah. You don't actually understand. Yeah, you have he came and he violated so, so many of our rules. So and many stuff. rules. Yeah. Even the people who loved him the most. We're like, what is this guy doing? He's insane. <laughs> and denied him uh-huh. when it came down to it. So, um, But the concept that we're talking about is abandoning ourselves in order to look good, in order to belong, in order to fit. Mm -hmm. And here, when you have those, when you're abandoning yourself in order to belong for these other people, whether it's the denomination, the the specific institution you're part of, whether it's the people group, whether it's the leader that's part of any one of those people that you abandon yourself for are your God. Yeah. And you need to look at that. Even if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're like, ah, been listening to your face series. I'm an atheist. I, I, I don't believe in God. Yeah. But there's, there's someone that you're kneeling, bending and kneeling to inside of your life right. that you're, that you're subscribing to their rule system for their sake and what they want. And you are making them your God inside of that space. Right. Um, and respecting this is, people isn't the same as doing a, a, agreeing with them and following all their rules. Yeah. Like one of the things I've thought is I have a lot of friends um, inside church worlds who don't like cussing. Like yeah. it really offends them. 
And I feel happy to not cuss around them. And I don't. Because I've, I'm like, I've spoken on plenty of church stages where I'm like, I don't say, you know, I monitor my mouth to respect like, oh, this is their space. Yeah. And so I think that there is like a value for I want to love and honor people. This is what I'm saying. People either abandon themselves or they're like, F you. Yeah. So it, oftentimes it's either like, I'll just never cuss in front of you ever, but live my secret life. Or I will be like, screw you. And I'll purposely drop the biggest F bombs and be as offensive as I can around you. And I think there's this middle ground of of being able to be honest and finding your people that feel real. But I learning how to see like everybody wants to belong. It's one of the reasons we abandon ourselves the yeah. most is because we want to belong. Yeah. How can we take out that fear of belonging and actually begin having conversations with people that are real and honest. And you can start that in your community. You can be the one that's like gather a couple friends and start hanging out and be like, I want to create a space where we're honest and we're open and yeah. we actually accept each other and love each other through the ups and downs. I want to be a place where we can actually be ourselves and we can and go on the journey and I might be really imperfect at it and I might not know what I'm doing, but I want to commit to learning because this hidden life where you have to be good enough to, to be involved in church and God will mean that eventually you'll stop. Right. And, and actually it's meant that we don't have to perform. It's meant that we actually get loved in the midst of our messiness. And it's that being loved in our humanity is what empowers us to change. Well, you know, it's interesting because the more I stopped abandoning myself, mm -hmm. the more I got connected with who I am and taking care of my own heart, the less I was worried about the abandonment and the belonging inside of a, oh, a tribe or, or a culture. Because now all of a sudden I'm like, oh yeah, my soul doesn't feel abandoned by me. Mm -hmm. I don't, part of self abandonment is even when I shame myself, yep. I'm like, you're stupid, you're dumb. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you'd say that or mm -hmm. do that. It's not just adhering or uh, it's not just about giving my heart a voice. It's also about how I treat myself mm -hmm. on the other side of not following someone's expectations or rules or whatever that happens to be. Mm -hmm. And so I've created a, a pretty big history now of being like, I love you, Justin. You matter to me. I'm here with you. I'm not going to shame you. So that emotion of abandonment is really hard to settle in or hit me from a, a tribe, a group of people or whatever. Now, compared to before, it could pull me around. But now I'm pretty settled and I'm able to be like, okay, that's fine. That tribe or that group of people doesn't agree with me. Yeah, it's. It, I feel less lonely the less I abandon myself. Yep. I feel Thousand less percent. of a need for external validation right. when I'm having. I'm internally on my own team, and yeah. if this that feels, if this whole thing feels overwhelming, you're like, I don't know how to connect to myself. I don't know how to connect to my heart. I don't know what's going on inside of me. I don't know how to have needs. I don't know what rules I'm even following or not. That'd be a great reason to sign up for Living Fully Alive 2.0 2021. You're hysterical. How many times can we plug it this yeah. time? Yeah. So um, I think that the church, like any club, we want to belong. Yeah. And, and I don't want to, I'm not pooping on the church by having this conversation. <laughs> I'm shitting on it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the entire I'm not, institution. And I don't like when you call it the church. Yeah, I yeah, like, like, I like it to call the institution. Because the church is the people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You're having a conversation about an institution and tribalism. Yeah. Well, what I was saying, no, I don't remember what I was. Oh, it's really, it is the institution because it could be the political. Like if you're in, if you're a Democrat, you can abandon yourself when there's things you disagree with them on. Right. And you're like, oh, I actually don't agree with them on this, but I'm not allowed to disagree on these things. Uh -huh. So now I just have to shut this whole part of me down. Yeah. And then you can abandon yourself there. Same with if you're a Republican, same with any system right. that you're around it could be your work environment. Oh, oh at work, if yeah. I don't drink all the time, yeah. they're not going to think I'm a fun frat boy. Oh, then I have to abandon what feels normal to me in order to get people to like me, which is codependency. And we just, so this happens everywhere. So don't just get angry at churches because right. it's a, it's a belonging issue. And this happens yep. in every culture. And it, it can happen in a high small school, group of school, friends, small group of friends. Mm -hmm. It's I've had that happen before where I was in a group of friends and the culture of the friend group was one direction. 
and learning how to stand up and be like, hey, actually, I don't I don't want to talk bad about these people or, hey, actually, we've already complained about our jobs for an hour this week. Let's try something yeah. else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I know that you were talking about people with regards to their family. Do you have like kind of anybody's any family stories or person stories or anything like that that you might help elaborate? to their family yeah yeah oh just that um I, it was what i was saying before that they weren't honest and I, so i have this friend who's been like trying to get her family saved for years and years and years and so always saying the best things about her life and how god is always coming through and how and there's always been this disconnect between her and her family even though she really 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 loves them and wants the best for them the reason that anybody wants anyone else to get saved is because they love them and want the best for them. But fear and control can become. So this year she went through something so traumatic. She had to just share it with them. She was around them when the trauma happened. She shared yeah. it with them. It was the first time they bonded. Wow. Yeah. It was the first time they connected. Cause they were like, Oh, now you look like a real person. Now you feel vulnerable like right. us. Now there's not hierarchy anymore. And as Christian in any institution, Right. You often learn the system of hierarchy. If I look like I'm better than you, you'll want to be like me. Right. Instead of I can lead by being weak, I can lead by being vulnerable. Intimacy matters much more than me looking like I've figured something out and I'm trying to lead you. Yeah. I know even in our relationships, if I came into every relationship I had, like I'm a relationship guru, I'm above you and I know more than you. Yeah. There would never be real intimacy. That would never feel safe for the other person or for me. Yeah. I had a, um, one of the painters. Which, by the way, that happens with pastors all the time. We put them on a pedestal that there's a hierarchy that they're above us. Right. And it becomes a very weird relationship. And it becomes very isolating for them. Yeah. And I won't adhere to that. Yeah. Because I'm like, that's not fair to even do to them. No. It's like, hey, you got to have to be perfect. You, you don't have to be perfect. Yes. Come be messy with the rest of us. Mm -hmm. To lead doesn't mean you have to be perfect. To lead is just you being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I actually had uh, one of the painters on, uh, that, that was painting our house have a conversation with me. And uh, I, I don't know how the conversation got to this, but it sort of evolved into this painter's history and stuff like that. He was like, yeah, you know, I grew up in, in the Christian church. And he said growing up in it we weren't even allowed to go watch any movies right. it was so constricting and controlling and because my father and i he was actually raised by his dad mm. his dad had two sons mm. and raised him on his own cool and uh his dad is in the process of potentially dying oh. and his dad was there too and what he described was experienced with the extended family when they wouldn't adhere to the rules of the system. The extended family rejected them because they were too wild or crazy or they were whatever. They didn't fit inside of that bubble. And so he was like, you know, there's this big part of us that threw out a lot of that stuff because it just le led to basically elitism. Right. And you could see the pain and the history mm. of their family. And they were both precious men. And his dad, to some, is probably pretty rough around the edges. Totally. I happen to have the opportunity to get the best of people oftentimes because yeah. of the way I relate to them. Mm -hmm. So I had a really good experience with, with his dad and we got personable and stuff like that. And again, I if I wasn't that way, I'm like, yeah, you'd get the rough side. But I got the tender man who was like, let me share parts of my life mm. with you because you feel safe, because you feel ju non judgmental. And I'm looking at that going, oh, these people never rejected God. They rejected the institutionalized rule system that the people had placed on who God was and what it looked like to be connected to God. Right. And they feel a lot of pain over that rejection. Yeah. That's really good. I was thinking, um, I'm going to swing it a little bit of a different yeah. direction. Is that okay? Yeah. I was thinking about, there's this verse where Jesus says, no one takes my life from me, but I give it of my own free will. Yeah. And I was thinking, because oftentimes when people learn to not abandon themselves, and this is why people throw out all of religion, because they, they can't figure out how to be inside of an institution and not abandon themselves. It's right. like baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Um, and our goal would be to learn how to meld the two because true freedom is you can be inside the church the institution, 
sorry, the institution, you can be outside the institution and you can feel like connected to who you are and not mm-hmm. abandon you in either. But there is this place of, so it'd be like this. Let's say I'm talking to a friend and they really need to talk. And I'm like, okay, I have the choice to speak up and share about my life. Or not because I'm scared of them not liking me or whatever. I can choose of my own free will to love them by this time just being about them. Right. But that won't become a pattern and that won't become like a forever. But like I can choose to lay down. It's kind of the same thing of like I accept that I cuss and I feel comfortable with my lifestyle choices. And I can choose around people to to give my life up to honor them. And it's different choosing that out of I'm powerfully choosing this. I'm making a powerful decision. I'm making, I'm choosing to meet you where you're at. Instead of I'm abandoning me to make you happy with me. Right. So the thing is, is I can do the same action from a different heart posture, from two different heart postures. And this is where people get confused. And then once they learn not to abandon themselves, they never serve again. They never lay down their life. They, they do become narcissistic a-holes. Totally. And I have found that like, in our own marriage, there's been places where I used to fawn. I would just do whatever would make you happy so that you'd be happy. Right. And then there's, and then I've grown in learning. I miss like, that, Abby. <laughs> she didn't last very long. No. And so then there is the the other side of it of now like, okay, I don't want to do this thing. But I, like last night, you wanted me to go get you a glass of water. I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to stay in bed. Right. But... I don't feel like I have to do it because I've learned I don't have to abandon myself. I've learned that I can say no. And so I actually want to choose this, not because I feel bullied, not because I feel like you'll be frustrated if I don't, not because I feel like love will get stolen from me, but I actually feel like I want to make the choice to love you. Right. And that's where... That's where true healthy sacrifice comes in is because mm-hmm. it's not a forced thing. It's a deliberate action. It's like Jesus. Jesus' s- sacrifice mm-hmm. was one of those of like, oh, I don't have to do this. Nobody yeah. takes this from me. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting here deliberately g- giving the sacrifice of my life away and allowing you to apprehend me and allowing myself to go through this terrible, painful process because I love you so much that I want to. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, so that's what Paul Young is saying. Other centered love is, Mm -hmm. and this is the goal that we become like Jesus who could give other centered love. And Jesus had so many boundaries. He went away by himself. He had boundaries on which people came with him to which things. Sometimes he brought three, sometimes he brought 12, sometimes he brought 70. Like he, he would go and do what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. He'd say, I don't want to go here. I do want to go here. And then there were times when like he, there's this one time where he pulled away to get alone time and this crowd followed him and he was moved with compassion and went and healed all of the sick and did good right. among the people. And so there was this thing of he knew he could separate and have boundaries. Yeah, because he'd go recharge in the wilderness and he's like, I'm out. So yeah, peace out. <laughs> and then there was this other side of him that knew no, I want to choose yeah, to lay I wanna, down I my wanna life. I want to give my life like this in this moment. And that's really, really beautiful. It's powerful. And that is, I mean, that's, I think the ultimate goal is that we learn that, and it's hard to learn the balance. And I have a lot of compassion on myself and my friends because sometimes I overly abandon myself still. And sometimes I overly set boundaries. Yeah. And I, and I am not perfect at it. And I want my friends to have the capacity to not be perfect at it either, but we're going towards the goal that we are learning how to, to really truly love the people around us, which is, again, it means it's authentic. It means if I'm laying down my life, I really am laying down my life. Yeah. For the most part, I, to the best of my ability, I try to be honest with my friends, like what I do or do not want to do, what I truly do or do not Mm -hmm. think about stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'll look in retrospect of a moment and be like, oh, I wasn't being honest with myself there and I didn't get honest with them. I probably need to, you know, come back around to that and be like, "Mm, I just, you know, I actually am frustrated about this. I didn't realize I was, but now I need to talk to you about it. My point is this, a lot of them feel really loved Mm -hmm. because they always know where they stand with me for the most part. Yeah. 
unless I have delayed understanding of myself. I'm like, I didn't realize, but I'm for so the last sorry. month I've had a problem because I just wasn't aware on this one. I'm so sorry. But when I do get awareness, I try to be very right deliberate away. about jumping up off my couch and going after a conversation on it. One of the, th oh, did you have something? Well, I was going to say, and that again, that's why they, they feel loved. Mm -hmm. They feel safe. They feel safe. They know where they stand. They know where they stand. And, you know, some people in the past would be like, oh, it felt scary or abrasive in the, initially. But then the idea that someone would be that honest about things. Yeah. But now it just feels good because I'm not in constant um, fight or flight, hyper awareness, trying to figure out what's inside of your head like I have to do with other people. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, I had something really profound to say. Probably oh, not. something that I think that would be really valuable is um, rules are often subconscious. Like oftentimes tr institutions, <laughs> I'm going to learn how to use words are actually helpful to use in the right way. So yeah. I agree with you. Institutions oftentimes have subconscious rules that you're not aware of. Friendship yeah. groups often have subconscious rules that you're not aware of. They're not saying to belong to our friendship group, you have to <laughs> gossip. You know, they're not saying to belong to our church, you have to be here four times a week or and serving. Or, or you, you have count. to be on the front row every Sunday. Or if you miss a week, then we think that you are dancing with the devil. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the idea is like there's always, I think, even in, in the culture that I currently am in, there's such a subconscious, anything that's celebrated, rules get made around. So there's such yeah. a celebration of instantaneous breakthrough in the culture that we live in, which can make by accident, a culture that if you don't have spontaneous breakthrough or instantaneous breakthrough, then it's then that's not as good. That's not as valuable. And I don't feel like I don't I don't fault them. I'm like, it's I don't know how you can think through all the things, celebrate this, but also celebrate this and celebrate this, but also celebrate this. Like it, it's maddening to try to create a, a place where there's no rules. There'd be no way to do it. Even on your, if I, if I have a culture that celebrates love and acceptance, then people glorify love and acceptance and they find a rule around that. Mm -hmm. I've seen that happen in our LFA groups before where there's this one person that used to make me laugh all the time because they would message me. So in, in living fully alive, we have a Facebook group and pe the reason people love doing it is the community aspect. You're getting to go on this journey with other people and it's this amazing connection process. So they would message me all the time being like, this person said this thing and they wanted me to chastise this person who said something that they thought was a little bit too judgmental or wasn't loving enough or wasn't <laughs> compassionate enough. And they wanted me to judge them for their judgmentalness. And so it, it like, even then I'm like, I didn't create, I wasn't creating a rule that everybody has to be compassionate all the time. I want people to be free. Yeah. I, I, I be messy. I want people to be empowered. I, I like the culture of compassion much more than judgment, but, um, but they created their own rule system out of our culture. Right. So I don't want to demonize institutions. Right. I don't know that there is a, like, I'd love for you guys to sit and think about it there. Even in your family culture, the things that you love can also become like you love celebrating food. That can also become a, well, we don't know how to hang out if food's not involved. Like it's just, it happens. Well, here's Our what goal happens is to not abandon ourselves in the midst of the rules. In a healthy balanced world, as we get resolve, mm -hmm. we walk into those environments and we, we, as, as our resolve has happened, say the family, you know, the institution of the family and the culture that's there. And instead of becoming more angry and mm -hmm. trying to change everyone, grace and compassion forms. Yeah. Because you start looking at it and going, I've been a part of this. Yes. I have the capacity to create this. Mm -hmm. I just like that I have a little bit more self-awareness now so that I'm able to live a little bit more free than I did mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably going to keep causing my own messes too. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to learn and grow. And hopefully we'll all learn and grow as we continue to operate out of grace and compassion. And that's the thing is if I look at myself as better than those institutions where I abandon myself mm -hmm. If I get angry and I vilify that institution yes. fully, I'm bound to repeat it somehow yes. in my own life. And, yes. and, 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 and that, that's part of the healing process is, again, when I can formulate a space inside of my own soul of grace and compassion 
to see the pain that I was in, to see the pain that they're in, to see the messiness of my humanity, to see the messiness of their humanity and go, none of us are above either, 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 or I'm just a little bit more aware of what I was participating in. Yeah. I think that's really good because this is where I see a lot of elitism show up Totally, when people deconstruct and they're like, Oh, look at you. You abandon yourself inside of that institution because mm-hmm. you're less um, enlightened than mm-hmm. I am. Mm-hmm. I'm more enlightened than you. Mm-hmm. I don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And and the I truth I don't is, abandon myself. <laughs> which is not even true. Most no. people most people quit one way of abandoning themselves for another way. Yeah. And so the the concept would be, "Oh, I see that you're abandoning yourself inside that institution. I feel pain because it reminds me of when I used to do that." Yeah. But also, I remember I can do that, and so I have a lot of compassion for you, and I can have compassion while still deciding that's not my preference. Yeah, I don't want to be a part of that system. It's not my preference, but it doesn't mean I'm better than you. Yeah, and there's there might be leaders that you're thinking of as you're listening to this that have perpetuated those systems, where you can even go into grace and compassion for them. Mm-hmm. If you get healed inside of yourself and you take care of your own stuff, you'll be able to look at them and be like, oh. That's really rough. They probably were expected really strongly by the leaders over them to yes. fulfill this mandate. And they're probably living in a lot of pain in their soul, trying to fulfill all of these expectations. Oh, I have so much compassion on them and the byproduct of what they've created. And I'm not better than them. I probably would be in the same position if I was there. And my point of that is that it's very easy, again, to vilify leaders. Mm-hmm rather than formulate grace and compassion towards them. And once you get to that grace and compassion for those leaders, like Abby said, you may not stick inside of that institution. Yeah, I can still have boundaries. You may say, hey, that's not the space that I'm going to continue to participate in. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to find another space that seems to have a... uh, Fit my core values better. Fit my core values better and still be messy, but fit my core values better. And I'm still going to walk away having a gentle heart towards them. Yeah. It's a really interesting thing. I think finding an institution is kind of like dating. Mm -hmm. Like the truth is no matter who you marry, marriage is going to be hard. There's going to be times Mm -hmm. where it feels magical and times where you have to work through a lot of really hard stuff. And that's how it is with any institution you're a part of. Yeah, There's going to be times where it's magical and times you work through really hard stuff. But in dating, there are definitely people that are better fits for you. Yeah. There's definitely people that feel less toxic to you. There's definitely people that trigger you less. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so you're allowed to actually find your preference. Yeah. Yeah. So we hope that um, this is inspiring you to be able to to pay attention to you, who you are and your own voice so that you don't abandon yourself so long that then you have to throw out. Like I often think that God gets thrown out for reasons that has nothing to do with who God is. Yeah. Like people are like, I'm done with religion. I'm done with church. I'm done with God because of abandoning themselves for 20 years Mm -hmm. where there could be a place of like, yes, but God was never asking you to abandon yourself. That's just what you believed from the leaders. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so there's actually a safe, a safe being, a safe creator that would like to go on the journey with you in learning how to not abandon yourself. I found more of a connection with God when I don't abandon me because he created me to be connected to myself. Yeah. And that's why we made this podcast, get connected to yourself, get connected to others and get connected to God or the life right in front of me, however mm-hmm. it goes. Yeah, however it goes on your yeah. own podcast. Hey, so if you're getting anything out of this series, rate, review, subscribe and share. Tell share it. friends and family about Send this. Send these to yeah. your family. Yeah. Talk about it. Send them to your pastors, your leaders and be like, let's have a conversation about faith. <laughs> Boy, I'm going to get some hate mail that for that. so great. I love it. I love it. I love it. And if you want to sign up for Living Fully Alive, signups will be up soon. Early bird um, rates will apply till March 31st. So um, get ready for that. And the course will start April 28th. This is the first year we've done it two years in a row because we had so many people message us. Two times in a row. Two times in a year is what I meant. Mm -hmm. Um, We had so many people message us that they'd like to do it. This is also the course that we recommend if you're wanting to do life consulting or coaching or anything that has to do with people because we process the foundational values that you need to understand about humans if you're going to work with them in any capacity. Great point. Goodbye. Go away. (laughs) 
I'm done talking today. <laughs> I'm my pocket full of sunshine has it's, gotten dim. <laughs> I feel tired again. Maybe oh, I need more caffeine. Caffeine crash. Food. I need food. Yum 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 yum. yum, 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 yum.